After many years exploring the remnants of a past, highly advanced lost civilization, a civilization who after extensive study, we have identified fingerprints of on literally every continent on Earth, whose identity we have relentlessly searched for, we now feel, after several astonishing realizations, that it may have been right under our nose this entire time. A civilization that no matter which ancient ruin you find yourself within the world over, undoubtedly vanished during a mysterious event, coming to an untimely demise at the hands of a possible cataclysm, with many theories surrounding a great flood of biblical proportions. As most of you will be aware, there exists legends of a mysterious civilization, which seemingly shares these rumors of demise, yet the connection between them as far as the general population is aware, has never been made. A civilization that many a scholar has concluded was not only a highly capable, technologically advanced and highly intelligent group, but was also hell-bent on world domination. This civilization is most commonly known as the Atlanteans. Illogically, however, regardless of the immense study of this group traveling far and wide, in pursuit of this world control, we have only ever been told of them existing upon a single mystical continent, a place that has been searched for by countless people for over 2,500 years. Yet, predictably, academia staunchly deny any existence of this past culture, or indeed its influence upon a now lost part of human civilization. However, we feel this is a clue which will support our following assertions. Researchers and scholars worldwide have discussed Atlantis for many years, proposing a number of theories and personal opinions as to its past location. A theory of a single continental inhabitation we now feel has been a successful red herring, leading many a talented investigator down an inevitable dead end. Ken Fetter Professor in archaeology, however, suggested several things regarding Atlantis in his book Frauds, Myths, and Mysteries – Science and Pseudoscience in Archaeology. Professor Ken suggested, as a result of extensive exhaustive study, that the Atlanteans were incredibly sophisticated, yet perceived as an evil culture that attempted to dominate the world by force. Professor Ken portrays the Atlantean civilization as an evil and war-based civilization, whose only goal was conquest. A hypothesis we feel we can not only support, but extend upon with a large volume of our own research. A Swedish scientist and writer called Olaus Redbeck proposed a rather interesting theory between 1679 and 1702. He wrote a 3,000-page treatise comprising a total of four volumes called Atlantica, in which the author attempts to suggest, and indeed prove, that Sweden was Atlantis, the cradle of civilization, and that all human languages evolved from Swedish. We do not confirm nor deny this hypothesis, but we do feel, regardless of where the Atlanteans originated from, they were not existing upon a single mystical continent that sunk into the abyss but were indeed the dominant force which could be found settled throughout the world. Through our own continuing extensive research of ancient ruins around the world, and the numerous links that we have individually made surrounding these particular ruins, technological characteristics, similarities in building techniques, and unexplained architectural advances, we have concluded that these technologies were shared, not constructed by the same group, but shared as if by a dominating force. Varying from continent to continent in style, with slight alterations present in the techniques involved in the construction of many still surviving sophisticated ancient monuments. We have found, and indeed proven beyond doubt, that there is indeed undeniable links between the technologies used in their construction. For example, the enigmatic tool marks found upon megaliths are uncannily similar. The techniques used to build such monuments, such as metal clamps, although varying in shape and metallurgy, the actual knowledge behind such advancements 
seems to have been shared by a controlling ruling class, who we now feel matches the known identity of the Atlanteans, the only logical culprit, supported by historical rumor of their technological dominances, the only suspect present within ancient historical accounts, and although these scholars search for a particular continent, we feel we can argue were present on nearly all. Interestingly, there once existed an unquestionably important historical depiction, found upon a Mayan plaque, showing the extinction of this mythical advanced civilization at the hands of supervolcanic eruption and a resulting deluge. We hypothesize, and we feel quite logically, that Atlantis sunk due to a worldwide cataclysm, and although they may have indeed originated from a specific location, Atlantis was not a single continent, but the pre-Diluvian world, thus can be identified as the worldwide advanced civilization we have searched for, and regardless of our own continued research, which supports the existence of a civilization that does indeed match their description, clues have also been left to us regarding this possibility throughout history by some of the greatest philosophers to ever live. If, for example, a supervolcanic eruption was to occur, possibly triggered due to naturally occurring increases in solar energy, possibly a cyclical characteristic of our own sun, then this gigantic plume of ash would plunge the Earth into complete darkness for an unknown duration, possibly triggering an ice age. However, immediately prior to this plummeting of temperature, a dramatic increase in worldwide temperature would be experienced due to this belch of volcanic activity. This dramatic rise in global temperature would melt the ice caps at an incredible pace, flooding the Earth and thus giving birth to the legends of the sinking of Atlantis and indeed the biblical flood. This once existing artistic depiction of this event, created by a surviving Mayan artist, not only shows the eruption of a gigantic volcano, but a man in a boat attempting to escape this event, rowing away hopelessly into the rising deep blue ocean, surrounded by drowning parties and a sinking landmass covered in ancient pyramids which can be seen behind. This landmass, according to the artist, was known as Astlan, which translates to English as Atlantis. Our theory that Atlantis was not one continent but the actual demise of this worldwide advanced civilization, and indeed the world as they knew it, which sunk dramatically, subsequently reformed by this dramatic melting and freezing over the duration of mere weeks or even days, is also supported by a clue left by Plato. According to Plato, and indeed Greek mythology, Atlantis was protected by the god Poseidon, who for some unexplained reason, made his son Atlas king of this mythical land. We perceive this explanation given by Plato as a clue to the fate of not only Atlantis, but the pre-Diluvian world. Atlas being the defining individual and indeed word which could unravel this mystery. Is it mere coincidence that Atlas is incredibly similar in lexical similarity to Atlantis, and also that it is the name given to the map of modern landmasses, and indeed the oceans of our modern world? Could this making of Atlas as king by Poseidon, claimed by Plato, be an admittance to an awareness of the Atlanteans' fate by Plato himself? With Poseidon deciding the fate of Atlantis, the god of the sea, earthquakes, and thus cataclysm? Has this mythical continent of Atlantis never been found because we have already found it. Proof of their existence, and indeed inhabited landmasses, being all the existing advanced ancient ruins we so often cover here on our channel, which escape explanation, surviving above the waves. Not only has the ancient pyramids been found to have once been submerged under several meters of seawater, but countless other ruins we have covered also share this intriguing characteristic. Are we looking at the past existence of the Atlanteans every time we explore an as-yet-unexplained advanced ancient ruin? 
The instructors of these ruins, the font of this knowledge, having been the Atlanteans themselves, who, just like the legends tell of, met their untimely demise at the hands of a great deluge? We find the evidence to suggest such highly compelling. If we could prove beyond doubt that our continued posit of an ancient, once highly advanced yet pre-Ice Age civilization once existing here on our planet, we would literally have to rewrite our understandings of antiquity. We have covered numerous sites, found submerged all around the world. Yet, unfortunately, due to their proximity to islands and the continental regions they are found amongst, many are dismissed as merely being 5 to 10,000 year old ruins, fitting with modern paradigm and, alas, avoiding controversy or the questions which inevitably follow. Yet, our next side of interest may turn out to not only be that most important of submerged ruins ever found on Earth but the smoking gun previously mentioned. On the 19th of May 2001, India's Union Minister for the Science and Technology Division, Murli Manohar Joshi, announced that the ruins of an ancient civilization had been discovered off the coast of Gujarat, in the Gulf of Kambahat. The site was discovered by INOT, National Institute for Ocean Technology. Using sonar, the discovered ruin is now being strongly argued as definitively pre-Ice Age, yet also advanced in nature. NIOT went on to describe an area of regularly spaced artificial structures. Located 20 kilometers from the Gujarat coast and spans 9 kilometers, Joshi claims the site as an urban settlement that predates the Indus Valley Civilization. Further descriptions of the site by Joshi describe it as containing regularly spaced dwellings, a granary, a bath, a citadel, and a drainage system. According to Wiki, quote, the structures and artifacts discovered by NIOT are the subject of contention. The major disputes surrounding the Gulf of Combat cultural complex are claims about the existence of submerged city-like structures, the difficulty associating dated artifacts with the site itself and disputes about whether stone artifacts recovered at the site are actually geofacts or artifacts. One major complaint is that artifacts at the site were recovered by dredging, instead of being recovered during a controlled archaeological excavation." End quote. Simply put, due to the fact that it has not been excavated properly, and we predict probably never will, academia are dismissing this ancient city as simply unconfirmed. We feel a quite ridiculous position to take despite NIOT's supporting data of its existence due to its accidental discovery, presumably via dredging. We find the marine archaeology in the Gulf of Kambat highly compelling. Divers from oil companies located within the North Sea have been discovering the remains of a drowned ancient city which once spanned from the UK all the way to Denmark. An ancient city so massive its suspected population has been estimated well into the tens of thousands. A team of climatologists, archaeologists, and geophysicists have now successfully mapped the area, which has revealed just how vast and expansive this once lost land once was. Many specialists are now claiming this was once the real heartland of Europe. This enormous civilization is now believed to have dated back to some 8,000 years ago, and that the landmass was submerged over a period of several thousand years, 
a submersion which began some 20,000 years prior. Dr. Richard Bates of the Department of Earth Sciences at St. Andrews, who organized the Drowned Landscapes exhibit, covering the finds within the UK, says the data reveals the human story behind Doggerland, a now submerged city of the North Sea that was once larger than many modern European countries. Could these discoveries reveal Doggerland as the real lost city of Atlantis? Several hypotheses have placed the sunken island of Atlantis within modern Northern Europe. Most noted among such researchers is Olaus Rudbeck, who suspected that Doggerland, as well as a Viking Bergen Island, which is thought to have been flooded by a mega tsunami following the Storega slide in 6100 BC, is the real location of Atlantis, a proposition he put forward all the way back in the 1600s. Some have proposed the Celtic Shelf as a possible location, and that there is certainly links to Ireland. Many places have been put forward for the possible location of the sunken city throughout the years, yet none have revealed ruins worthy of such claims, many of these areas being too small to have housed such an enormous city. Doggerland, however, fits the bill. Not only could it turn out to be the largest ancient civilization found on Earth, but it also rests in a possible location based on historical research for the city of Atlantis. It was submerged at one point in its history, and it is revealing astonishing ruins of a once great and presently unknown civilization. Dr. Bates, a geophysicist, said Doggerland was the real heartland of Europe until sea levels rose to give us the UK coastline of today. We have speculated for years on the lost land's existence, from bones dredged by fishermen all over the North Sea, but it's only since working with oil companies in the last few years that we've been able to recreate what this lost land looked like. When the data was first being processed, I thought it unlikely to give us any useful information. However, as more area was covered, it revealed a vast and complex landscape. We have now been able to model its flora and fauna, build up a picture of the ancient people that lived there, and begin to understand some of the dramatic events that subsequently changed the land, including the sea rising and a devastating tsunami. The research project is a collaboration between St. Andrews and the Universities of Aberdeen, Birmingham, Dundee, and Wales Trinity St. David. I will keep you posted on their future discoveries. Thanks for watching, guys, and until next time, take care. Over a hundred years ago, a curious discovery was made in a town now named after this Upart, Rockwell within Texas. An ancient wall was unearthed, and although it was clearly of an artificial nature, its possible age predictably made a number of people in the academic world deny its artificial origins in favor of a far less likely scenario involving natural formation. Although magnetic exploration suggested that the rock wall had been where it lay for over 100,000 years, its origins have been heavily debated ever since its initial discovery. In 1852, farmers in Texas were digging a well when they discovered the wall. Conservative estimates have placed its creation some 100,000 years ago. Yet now, many believe it to actually be an antediluvian relic left by a now lost civilization some 200 to 400,000 years ago. Dr. John Geisman of the University of Texas, Dallas, tested the rocks as part of a History Channel documentary, giving credence to the denial of its artificial origins, suggesting they formed where they were, claiming that they were all magnetized in the same way. This tremendous age has led many to believe in modern paradigm, to deny a man-made origin, as this does to corroborate with the Bering Strait theory and currently upheld timelines in regards to evolution. However, there are others in similar fields who have found curious characteristics of the wall which do indeed suggest artificial origins. Geologist James Shelton, for example, and Harvard's architect John Lindsay have focused on its unique design features, including architectural elements, archways, lintel portals, and square doorway and window openings, which all suggest not only artificial creation, but functionality for humans, which nature would simply not create. The depth or past height of the wall is also an impressive legacy. The family of T.U. Wade, who moved to the area and initially made the discovery, dug to a depth of 40 feet to try and find the bottom of the wall. This excavation, however, was abandoned without finding the bottom. 
Years later, in 1949, Mr. Sanders of Fort Worth took up the baton and continued excavational exploration of the wall, finding a number of megalithic stones at considerable depth and weighing several tons. After bringing them to the surface, mysterious pictographs were found upon them, further supporting the thesis of artificial origin. In addition, curious metal rings of modern composition were found embedded in rocks, suggesting the presence of lost technology. It would appear that the wall is indeed an antediluvian relic, one possibly submerged and subsequently buried in ancient sediment during the Great Flood. Modern studies have found that the wall is in fact six stories tall and 20 miles in length, with a number of individuals now attributing the wall to a lost civilization of giants due to its inexplicable nature. Quote, it is good when examples like rock wall appear that test our abilities and cause us to question basic Newtonian mechanistic assumptions that have not been modified for over 150 years. Physics had to abandon this approach at the turn of the century, opting instead for relativity and quantum mechanics in order to further their understanding of matter and the universe," said James Shelton, geologist from New Orleans. It is a relic which we find highly compelling. Although many academic bodies and the individuals funded by said institutions are only allowed to attribute ancient ruins to known heavily researched past civilizations. There exist many features within these sites, found all over the world, which tell a very different story. Not only are they indicative of an ancient civilization far more capable than our well-studied more recent ancestors, but many of them share features within their builds with many other sites who are separately claimed by the as-mentioned institutions as the work of completely different past civilizations, who we feel are far more likely, based on said evidence, to have been mere re-inhabitants of these sites, which allowed these civilizations to flourish, adopting said features into their own cultures, and often claiming said works as their own to outside groups. Not only do the similarities show an undeniable connection with sites currently argued as completely isolated ancient works of architecture, but many of the most astonishing features of said sites are not only ignored, but often overlooked by the world as a result, which we also feel is strong evidence of not only a deliberate attempt to ignore the facts in favor of fallacy, but clear proof of a conspiracy which is largely funded in an effort to keep these particular proverbial smoking guns hidden and under wraps, often avoiding further study as a result. This clearly due to the reality they contain regarding facts about the history of man, which academia is not only responsible for hiding in favor of funding, but are responsible for hiding the true history of man from man himself in an effort to merely appear all-knowing in the face of things they currently have no explanation for. And the so-called Inca Road is indeed one of these said ancient anomalies, which is of an astonishing size. It is so big, in fact, it even dwarfs the Great Wall of China. An ancient relic so big, it can be seen from space. One might ask, how can I not have been informed of such an ancient relic? But once one realizes the current academically baffling accomplishment this so-called Inca masterpiece must have once been, the conspiracy to keep such a site largely unknown will become clear. It is a road system that not only links nearly every unexplained ancient ruin currently known to exist within Peru, connecting Puma Punca, Sacsayhuaman, Machu Picchu, Olante Tambo, along with many others. It, in fact, covers an incredible 25,000 miles, topping the Chinese wall by nearly 7,000 miles, going all the way through Peru, Chile, and spreading out far beyond, with bridges, tunnels seemingly carved straight through cliff faces, and even following sheer drops, once cut horizontally into near-vertical rock faces, 
with plunging sides dropping at times thousands of meters to valleys below. We strongly believe that although the road has clearly been utilized by an unimaginably large number of travelers and has been severely eroded away nearly everywhere, the method of construction now hidden by erosion, that this surface, just like that of the roads of Pompeii, were actually formed using a now-lost stone technique, now largely known as that of polygonal masonry. Not only a lost, now unexplained technique of stone building, indicative of a lost civilization and technologies, but the sheer size of the road and the features accomplished along its incredible length still provides countless unexplained features, which cannot be explained as Inca. Yet not only is it and its features academically ignored, but we feel the proposition of it being an Inca relic, just like all the ancient sites we have already covered in which it connects, are far too advanced to be claimed as Incan. How can one claim that such a relic was built by our more recent ancient ancestors, when not only does this site link much of ancient Peru and is largely ignored, but not only the road but all said sites currently hold feats of ancient engineering which cannot be explained. It is clearly a feature that is indicative of a far more advanced, far more ancient civilization, which once constructed this road and the sites found along it, merely re-inhabited by our now well-studied far more recent ancient ancestors. It is a place we find highly compelling. In 1768, the Thunderstone, an enormous Rapakivi granite boulder currently claimed to have weighed 1,250 tons, was successfully moved many miles by our modern ancestors. A stone which gained its name from a lightning strike having split it from the bedrock. This feat, if true, would alter many attested views regarding the currently understood limitations of ancient civilizations. It would insinuate that the successful movement of seemingly impossibly huge stones used in ancient constructions were done by the claimed civilizations. Sculpted by the French sculptor Etienne Maurice Falconet and transported by Marinos Carbares, a lieutenant colonel in the Russian army, who was tasked with figuring out how to move the stone from Lantka six kilometers inland from the Gulf of Finland, to its final location beneath a bronze statue of Peter the Great within St. Petersburg. Originally embedded deep within the ground in an area of marshy terrain, they had to develop revolutionary methods to transport the colossal stone. Waiting until winter to liberate the stone from the earth and attempt to move it over solid frozen ground. This, however, is where diligent research and academic assumption part ways. Although there are engravings of the stone, nearly in its original shape, seemingly being moved across the earth by manpower, many modern researchers of this event, along with a number of highly capable scholars, believe that these images were taken on the first day of the stone's transport. Many suspect that Catherine the Great, present at the event, was there only to witness the start of this arduous task. After this event, she traveled back to St. Petersburg to await its arrival. What's more, this first day, according to numerous reliable yet rarely academically shared sources, state that in its original form, these workers were only able to move the stone an inch. A declaration, also according to these same sources, was made by Catherine herself, elated at witnessing this stone move an inch before departing for Russia. Not only do many independent researchers now believe that the original weight was incorrect, but also that when it was eventually moved, had lost a dramatic amount of his body. Falconet had originally intended to cut the stone to a mere 600 tons before its transportation, and as the original stone was seemingly impossible to move, when Catherine the Great left for St. Petersburg. Furthermore, now in position and attributed as over a thousand tons in weight, this is also an academic fallacy. As Graham Hancock's website puts it, quote, Seen from the back, the stone is about 3 meters wide at the top and 6 meters wide at the base. If it were shaped like a perfect cube, its weight would be some 1,200 tons. However, because the stone slopes on all sides, 
its weight does not exceed one-third of this, about 400 tons, a far cry from the currently touted 1,250 tons. It's claimed that, at 1,500 metric tons, the Thunderstone is the heaviest stone ever moved by human power, and that this is supposed to be a proof that no advanced technology was needed for the transport of colossal ancient stones. However, unlike Russians in the second half of the 18th century, Romans and their predecessors had no ball bearings, iron rails, or metal sledges. Those things all benefits of modern technology. As much as one has to admire Falconet's engineering achievement, what he has proved is that technology of the late 18th century was indeed capable of transporting large megaliths." End quote. It seems that the Thunderstone, being used as a proven example of primitive techniques and civilization, able to have constructed the currently unexplained sites which dot the Earth, however, like with many other academic explanations as to the construction of these sites, it is not only contradictory to the facts, but based on a faulty premise. Due to these deliberate twisting of the facts, the story of the Thunderstone is undoubtedly highly compelling.